Dad Raymond, we appreciate you coming. Ask him some questions because he is the person that's got to go back to Buford. So if you got a few questions, try to get them in because that's a long way to ride if you got to get up and work tomorrow. So Dad, we appreciate it. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for having me. Um, like uh, Mark said, I'm uh, with the Department of Plant Industry, and most of you it, probably have never even heard of our department. We are in the regulatory side of Clemson University. Uh, most states is with the Department of Ag, but in South Carolina and several other states in the South, it is with the, some, a university. So primarily what we do is we are our purpose is to protect South Carolina agriculture and the native environment and nurseries, tree farms, that sort of thing from invasive pests, uh, be it animal, plant, um, uh, insect, virus, all those, all those situations. Anything that comes in that could really affect our, our industries in South Carolina, especially on the ag forestry side, we, uh, we really try to help mitigate that if it does happen and prevent it. And the e prevention, as we know, is the easiest, um, uh, easiest thing. So as far as sweet potatoes go, do you, any of y'all have sweet potato fields that we have put traps on? Sweet potato weevil traps? Does anybody have that? So they're in the, I'll show you a slide in a minute. There is an insect and it primarily stays to the east of I-95 called the sweet potato weevil. And as if, if y'all will look at this picture, this is a boll weevil trap. It's the same exact trap that, that you see around every cotton field in the state, uh, but we just use a different lure, and it's to catch what we call the sweet potato weevil. And the sweet potato weevil is a terrible little insect that really affects production of sweet potatoes. It uh, can get in the vine, the, the female can get in the vine and she'll lay the eggs in the vine or in the root. And uh, because of our warm uh, seasons, there can be up to eight generations of this in a summer or in, a, in, a, in the growing season. And the problem is, and what we think is one of the major reasons that it tends to stay on the other side of 95 is because one of the other hosts is morning glory. And y'all know how to add it, that is everywhere. So it's not like you can not plant sweet potatoes and say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let this lay fallow for a year or two and get rid of this insect because it also stays in uh, morning glory, which is uh, uh, akin to the sweet potato. Uh, and this is the little insect that you see, and it looks, like looks like a love bug and an ant. So I, it, but you, w it, these are one of the few insects that we catch in traps that we don't really have to send to the lab to identify. As you can tell, it's a strange looking little fella. But um, we do just for, for verification. But this is what is the major pest of sweet potatoes in South Carolina that we as a regulatory agency deal with. And it's hard to see in these, but there, there's, you can see the actual individual uh, insects, and that's a vial, and that's compared to a dime, so not real big. Uh, the, when they, if, you, if you do find some damage on a sweet potato, it looks like uh, somebody's poked it with a bunch of matchsticks, because that's the size of the hole that it comes out, and it's very distinctive. Um, on the sweet potato or on the vine, on the actual potato or on the vine. They will do e either or. Um, and um, they, like I say, the, the difficult thing is our long, warm seasons, and there's so many that can be produced, uh, so many generations that can be produced. So th what we have done is every year we, uh, we uh, put out these traps that I showed you. So these are the counties in South Carolina, all of Georgia has a quarantine on it, meaning every uh, the, Georgia decided that instead of breaking it down by individual counties, everywhere in Georgia is quarantined for, um, for this uh, weevil. That benefits Georgia in uh, several ways. It, it, it's according to what the state does as far as how we quarantine uh, things. If you quarantine the entire state, then it's very easy to move 
that product throughout the entire state, right? Because you don't, you're not breaking quarantine, you're not leaving quarantine. The only problem is, is if somebody from, say, Tennessee wants sweet potato, sweet potatoes or slips or anything like that, they can't get it from Georgia without a hassle because the whole state is quarantined. Well, South Carolina is different. We decided that instead of quarantining the entire state, we would just quarantine the counties that we found this weevil in. And we do it different for different pests. It's all according to, we get a lot of input from, from the agricultural community. We get a lot of input from uh, extension. It's all based, it's a, it's, I don't want to say it's a game, but it is a game trying to figure out what benefits everybody. We've got to protect everybody, but we've got to protect our interest. It's, 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 a, it's a shuffle all the time. And so what we do is we set traps every year on every sweet potato field that we find. Um, so right now the counties are under quarantine are Jasper, Beaufort, Colleton, Charleston, and Berkeley. That means that you can ship sweet potatoes, any sweet potato part, anything to do with sweet potatoes, leaves, it doesn't matter, into those counties, no problem. But once it goes into those counties, it cannot come back out because those counties are in quarantine because it is a risk that this insect will come with it when it comes back. And we don't want that. So if you're within a quarantine, you can move anywhere freely. But we don't want material, we don't want, we don't want, sweet potatoes that are grown in Charleston County to come to Columbia because there is a very high risk that this sweet potato weevil is in it. Because when we find these little boogers, we don't find one. I, it, is, it, is, it is no guesswork whether it's an a infestation or not. So the way that we do this and the way that we narrowly keep these few counties in quarantine is by the trapping. Last year, in 2014, I just put these kind of stats to show how it has progressed. The guy who is, his name is Matt Howell, and he can't be here tonight. I'm a fill in. I'm the field guy. So he's the guy who really knows this information. But he, um, he, he started this trapping program, different trapping program in 2017, and you see the difference it makes. We used to put out about 94 traps, and we would trap the whole season from virtually from after risk of frost to whenever you put them in storage. So it, it, it was the whole season. And we didn't cover a lot of area and we didn't get a lot of information. So in 2017, we decided, well, the best thing we do is we'll, late in the season, actually some, some people are already digging by the time we get our traps out. We, that's when we set our traps because that's when kind of the height of everything is hot. You know how the insects are at the end of the years. You plant a late garden and it's a mess dealing with insect bugs. So we said, well, that's the time to trap. We can cover more area and we can do more trapping and get a better idea of what's out there. So we've really drastically increased the number of traps. Um, and this is statewide. Everywhere we get our information from NRCS and um, they just tell us a field. We don't get any contact information we don't get anything we pretty much get a map with a field on it and a lot of times we'll try to find a, who owns it who farms it because but you know it, it, whoever owns it usually doesn't farm it it's, it's it's a it's past so if we can't get that information we'll put the traps by a power pole something like that on private on the on the on a uh, right of way or something as close as we can get but the reason we do that is so that we can keep these counties out of quarantine. That makes it so much easier if you want to move, buy, sell, trade, whatever your, your, your product. And it's really for the benefit of everybody because if you've got this issue and you don't do something about it, even though it might affect what you can do with it at first, it really benefits you because it benefits your neighbor and it benefits the entire state as far as there's a lot of canneries right across the border in North Carolina that we send stuff to. I, it, it, there's a lot of movement of sweet potatoes too. So Orangeburg County, um, everybody, everybody's good up here for right now. We did have, there has been a field or two in Orangeburg County that has, we have found the insect come because unbeknownst to who had it, they brought some stuff out of Charleston and it started a small infestation. Now, we, uh, with the help of extension, um, the, there was uh, chemicals applied and, and it was eradicated, luckily, because it was caught very early. 
So therefore, Orangeburg County is not in quarantine. So that's, that's what we need y'all's help with, is that if you find a problem, let us know. We are not going to shut you down. We are not, that's this, the, we aren't the, F, the plant FBI by any means. We want help. I mean, because my granddad was a farmer. I'm from Calhoun County. He, they were from Holly Hill. So I understand the importance of all that. I, we care about keeping South Carolina agricultural strong and our ability to move uh, all, the, all, all of our products freely wherever. Yes, ma'am. So you're the only one. You're the only one that put the traps down? Yes, ma'am. We are, there is, well, last year I did the entire state by myself. So it, it was, I put about, it, let's see, <coughs> last year we had 284 traps. It was actually more than that because uh, the 284 was the ones we picked up. A lot of times they get run over. Uh, that. So, so I put about 315, 320 traps out. Um, and it was 20, just based on information we had, it was about 2,800 acres. But as you know, you don't find many 200 acres of, of sweet potatoes, especially up, uh, up in the PD, it's two acres, four acres, five acres. And I, I think I put 600 miles on my, no, 500 miles on my truck in one day, because I started before daylight, headed up. And I mean, it just riding all day long. Now I enjoy it because it's not the same old thing, but there's a significant amount of trapping. It took uh, about two weeks to put them out and two weeks to check them. Um, so, but we are the only ones who do it. But uh, that's, that's our role. We do a lot of trapping, not just for sweet potato wibbles. I'll, I'll show you some other pests that we do, but we, we do a lot of trapping for that. Yes, ma'am. Is the um, trapping restricted to you because of regulation? Yes, ma'am. So a, a, somebody... <clears throat> Uh, planning personally you can't do the trapping you there you could do a well you could trap first of all it's not an effect when, when I'm saying trapping I'm really kind of looking for a couple of insects I'm not trying to I couldn't trap enough to help well, deter the breeding, population breeding for an infestation. right you, you, uh, you would have to get a level the trapping would allow you to find the insect and then determine how how bad your concentration is, and then you would have to chem either m remove the crop or tr chemically treat. Um, and that's determined by, that's when extension gets involved. Now, you as an individual can buy a trap and p buy the lure and do that and put traps out. It's just that we have the funding to do it. You don't have to pay for it. And we need that information for this quarantine material. Then what about the treatment for infestation? That's when, when if we find, well, in the lower, in those areas that are quarantined, you really don't do anything because there's, there's no, it's, it's beyond the point of treatment. So you're wasting money trying to, trying to resolve that infestation because it's too far. But on these borders, and if we find it in a county that we've never found it in, that's when, that's what we're looking for. We're trying to catch it as it moves and then we can call extension in. Extension makes recommendations on treatments, and then that, that's how that process works. So that's, we're really just trying to catch it in the early stage. The quarantine areas, they're, they're pretty much, the, I, we say, well, they're quarantined because there's nothing we can do. It's too much, too much, and with, with all of the morning glory, we don't have any way to control that. Because, I mean, it's in cornfields and DOT right-of-ways and everything else. So, but the main purpose of the trapping is to try to, we pretty much trap the edge, making sure that we aren't getting anything squeezing up. So, um, any other questions on that? Okay. So this is a surface insect as well as a ground boring insect? It, it's a surface insect that goes into the, well, it will, it will penetrate the, the roots, but right, right in that, it only, it's not like a Japanese beetle which will burrow in the ground. This one stays in the, in the, in the potato or in the vine. The problem with these candies, like I said before, is you've got the wild, um, the um, morning. morning glory. <laughs> Uh, that that it can overwinter in, so, but we, we do not see it in the ground just randomly. It is associated with with sweet potatoes. Is it a flying insect? It uh, does not fly very far, so um, uh, it, it the main the main travel is by moving material. It's, uh, 
uh, just trans it's man transportation really uh, they do move some but not not to the not to the extent that it's a hop a ride on 95 didn't go a long way yes sir this is a different question on the topic okay not helping yeah, my question is not on insects it's on wild hogs wild hogs that's DNR, thank goodness. <laughs> I, I, I was with DNR for a while, and I was glad to trade that one in. <laughs> but um, not today, Dr. Dicey, but um, we were taking note of it because I had the meeting I was able to attend to yesterday. I talked with Dr. Tory Heaton, and he said he'd love to come back to this area. So let's talk about it. <laughs> On your perspective, what, what do you see up there when you're doing trekking? Do you see wild hog causing a lot of menace to our sweet potatoes? Uh, in certain areas, they certainly can. They really can, and you know, uh, the it, like I said, it doesn't apply to this. But if you're close to a, a major river drainage, which you are, Edisto River is a pretty big system. Congaree River is a big system, and you've got hogs, um, and uh, it, if 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 that's a major food source that they run into at the right time, they can they can be devastating. Wow. So, I mean, they really can. They they they, they it, it's a matter of. You, they, you know, they're, they're very migratory. They move where food and water is, and they'll move through an area, and just because you don't have them now doesn't mean you won't get them. But, uh, and once you get them, they're, they're quite a, a so, uh, district. From insects, wild hogs, what are the pests that are bad for this information? Well, we've got um, one major one that Mark talked a, a little bit about earlier that I'm going to get to in a minute, which is a nematode, and uh, guava root, not nematode. And uh, now there are a lot of pests that Philip's going to talk about, just uh, it, pests that can have issues when growing and dealing in sweet potatoes. But the ones we're worried about are the ones that are regulated and federally regulated. So that means they're, they're of detriment not only to South Carolina, but other states. So it's, it's bad enough where other states are like, mm, we don't want any of that. So it's not, it's not like... Um, you know, everybody's got mosquitoes, and so it, you can't really do anything about that. But this, these are these are insects that we hope that we can contain, at least at least do a, as much as we can to contain them. All right. So the future of the trapping program. Um, these are just kind of some things that they were that they had put in here. So the green tag certificates. That is. If you're in Orangeburg County and you want to send something to North Carolina and they're requiring a, a certificate, then we can issue a certificate at, because we've trapped these fields and we can say, don't have sweet potato weevil. You can get a nematode test, which we don't have nematode, uh, guava root knot in Orangeburg County, so you know, you're, you're good with that. But we can certify that this material is good. So that's what the green tag does, and you won't get it in North Carolina without a certification. Not, not legally. I mean, you might slip it in after dark, but I don't recommend that. Um, so the, the major thing, too, is we try to, anytime we can come to, have y'all ever heard of this before? Have y'all ever heard of the issue with the sweet potato weevil or the sweet potato weevil quarantine? Most people haven't. A lot of people who grow tomatoes, I mean. What year was it detected here? The weevil? weevil? I don't know. It's been a while. It has been a while. I know that um, I could probably find that, but we'd really, there was, there's always been some trapping going on for the last uh, uh, 15 or so years. It's kind of been broken up, not, not a whole lot of consistency, but I know it, they found it in uh, Louisiana in the early 1900s. So uh, it, it's, it's been here, it's been around a while. Um, and on, on a lot of stuff, our website, Clemson um, Department of Plant Industry, has a lot of information, just general information on this, on a lot of quarantines. It kind of blow your mind, honestly, if you look at what all is regulated that you never thought was regulated. So that's why we're here. Honestly, I didn't even know my position existed before I put in for it. So, you know, you just don't know. Just, just don't know that. Um, but we really tried, there's, there's, now there, we hired one, so there's four of us in the state. So we have to, um, we cover a lot of ground, but um, enjoy it. All right, this is, this is guava root, not nematode. So every year we get grant funding from uh, USDA to do 
virtually random nematode sampling, trapping, soil samples, that kind of stuff. And we had a hit in 2017 on guava root, not nematode. And you, you talking about the sky was falling, then people, it, it was, it was, because we'd never heard of it, you know, we didn't know anything about it, but apparently this is a bad little dude. And um, we found it. Is that an insect? It is a nematode. It is a soil borne, uh, it's like a worm. Wouldn't you say? It was like a worm, micro worm is the best way to uh, describe it. But it is, uh, it really causes some serious damage. And uh, everybody who's got it or knows somebody who's got it is scared to death of it because it's a very difficult to control. Um, and especially now because of chemical applications and all, it, it's hard to find effective chemicals anymore because, you know, if it's effective, well, it probably works on other things too, you know. So it, it's, it's, just a, it's just a bad little deal. And they have been doing a tremendous amount of work uh, on, with research with this. And uh, we've got a, is Mueller's doing that down there? At, yeah, Dr. Uh, Mueller. At, at Estill Rec is doing a lot of research on it. Um, right now, it, it seems like that's the only place we have found it. Do you know of any place else that we have found it in South Carolina? Not at all. So it was a big scare, but it, it brought it to our attention because, uh, you know, and we do, you know, a lot of times people send in soil tests for nematodes, and you've always got some kind of nematode. If it doesn't show a nematode, it's, it's you, you got sand in your bag or a pot and soil. But most places do have some form of nematode, but this is one that was really scary. And um, we didn't know a lot about it. That's where there's a lot of research going on now. The main thing it affected with us was that Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas have now put a restriction on any plant material, like nurseries, if you have the nursery tree farm, anybody selling, sending plant, plants, uh, with, especially in potting soil or anything like that, has to have a nematode test before they can ship it to those states which uh, they are, they're big sweet potato states. And that's what everybody's concerned with because they don't want it because if you've got sweet potatoes, um, then, then you don't want that getting in and then getting into your sweet potatoes and then they start moving around and you don't know it and all of a sudden it's everywhere. That's, that's our main focus really is to try to stop things when we, at early stages. Um, that's, that's what guava root knot nematode will do for you for your sweet potatoes. So needless to say, that's concerning when, when, uh, when your, one of your major crops could be affected. And it will affect other crops too, it's just this is the one you see, see the most damage. Yes? Do you have any experience with using beneficial nematodes for pesticides? Like is there any um, you know, the, well, there. I don't personally myself. There, we uh, also in my department is the uh, organic certification department, and they do. You know, anything anything organic is not only it's the only thing that's legal, but highly recommended. I want you to be aware of it. I want this crop of sweet potatoes that we that you want to plant. I want it to be a successful industry, but I also want you to be aware of the things to look for, and let's don't make a stumble trying to, you know, trying to make a crop. I'm gonna try to talk fast. I told Philip and those this morning or earlier today when we were talking for the meeting, when we talked about it, I didn't have any slides. I must have had, I'm gonna say 50 plus. I spent a lot of the day trying to weed out some things. And so while I'm just gonna try to run through it, and if there's interest in it, please feel free to talk back to us or when we hand out the evaluation, just let us know. I'd like to know more about whatever. If you want more information on invasive species, we'd love to do it. We, we'll, we'll work with Thad's department and we'll make it happen if that's something that interests you. Um, I won't get into this slide too much, but the earliest sweet potatoes they think came from around Peru down in South America. C Christopher Columbus took it over to the new world or to the old world around Spain and that's where it caught on. So sweet potatoes have been a food source for many years. Um, it's also a big worldwide crop. We are really not the biggest nation to use sweet potatoes. And this is just to show you some of the different countries that do use sweet potatoes. 
China uses a whole lot. They got a lot of people to feed, and I didn't really know you could even grow sweet potatoes in China, but that's what I found out with this research. Um, this is something else we found that uh, sweet potato production and sales have increased over the years, but the last few years they've decreased for some reason. I really don't have the answer. Maybe Philip does. If not, you know, maybe we can figure it out. But this is not what I just wanted to show you that sweet potatoes is something that's a big industry, particularly in states like North Carolina, Louisiana, and Mississippi. They are a really big industry, and they, they are proud of them. But I think we can grow sweet potatoes just as good, so I want us in a few years to be proud of what we can grow with. It's in a garden, fresh market, or however we can market them. Um, variety selecting, selection depends very much on the variety in your market. I won't get into variety selection too much because I don't want to take anything from Philip. But most of them take from 90 to 150 days to mature. So if you're trying to get an early market, you may want to consider that. We are well blessed with sandy, well-drained soils. A lot of our soils are not heavy and compacted, but if you're growing in a bottom, as we call it, a range-type soil that we, with holds water, that's not well suited to um, productions of sweet potatoes. High levels of organic matter can cause a disease called scurf. Again, I won't get into that too much, but it is an issue with sweet potato production. Oh, you didn't? Well, I didn't really prepare myself too much to get in it, so I appreciate it. But we will talk a minute about some things you can do to try to keep yourself from getting it. One of them includes at least two-year rotations. If you can do more than that, I would recommend you to do that. One of the farmers, some of it that you may know around Rivers Bridge down in Earhart, he doesn't own a whole lot of land, but what he does, he talks with farmers and rents a piece of ground, I would say every three or four years before he comes back with sweet potatoes. And he's also a source of where we've picked up our sweet potatoes, and he sells a lot of slips. So it's, it's good to know that we do have a source of slips a little bit cheaper than going to Kmart or Orangeburg Milling. And you can also grow them yourself if you're interested in it. Um, I, there's some terminology with sweet potatoes. Um, slips, when you first talk about it, what are slips? Slips are basically vine cuttings or little plants that you pick up off of the potatoes. Now I could talk about this potato a good bit, but these little parts here you could call slips if it was done right. The only reason these are sprouted because I stored them and I did something called improper storage. But if you were to take these and cut them or pull them off and, and try to root them, they should take off. Now I don't like the fact the leaves haven't developed, but that's because they've been in the dark. And anyway, they, they are very easy to root and, and start. Um, when you pick, you can use potatoes and a lot of times you use these smaller potatoes such as this to, to grow your slips. You want to look and make sure that you've got good sound potatoes that doesn't have issues with it with such as diseases or something. And in some ways, to me, it's easier if you know a large farm in your area, just go buy what you need from him because you don't have to tie your money up in my situation, I've been some times I said I was going to plant sweet potatoes and I didn't. Or I didn't have my money tied up in seed potatoes. But if you want them early and you want a certain variety, that's another way to do it. Um, one of the professors I reached out is with the Louisiana State Ag Center. I sent him an email and he surprised me. He sent me something back that very night. But one of the things he said, I highly recommend that you get your growers to run soil tests for each field and include boron and sulfur in the report. That is the start of optimizing production. I've believed in boron for years, and I think it's something if you really want to push your production, you need to think about. Uh, fortunately, Clemson's standard soil sample includes those elements, so we don't have to do it extra. So that is good. Um, this is an example that I used in my little farm, and I figured that I, Mark Nettles wouldn't mind you seeing his soil sample. Sometimes we could get in trouble. But I had a spot in my garden that I wanted to grow something, and the pH came back 5, 6, and it was too late for me to put lime. 
But I found out that sweet potatoes can do good or good enough at 5.8. So I went ahead and planted sweet potatoes there. I, I had fair, I think it did well, but it would have been better than planting some of the other crops I was planting on planting, such as peanuts, which need a better pH than that. Um, this is just something I throwed up. I wanted you to see that some of the, the things that I have seen some of our farmers have, I think is very due probably to a boron deficiency. That's one of the elements that can leach out of our soil pretty easily. And in, in years past, it wasn't that expensive. Things have changed this year. Um, this is just to show you uh, what can happen if you withheld phosphorus. And I, I wondered when I first started doing this research and looking at things, why do they always tell you what variety it is? Well, one of the challenges of being a good sweet potato farmer is this different varieties respond to different management and different fertility in different ways. And about the only way you can really figure that out is to start on a small scale in a garden or something with a new variety and test it out and see how it works for you. Keeping in mind your market and all your other conditions. This, in case you haven't ever seen it, that's basically what slips look like. If you want to try to protect against getting scurf, they recommend that you cut an inch above the soil line because these things, when you start them, you would bury them under about, I'd say, five or six inches of soil at least, and they'll start getting roots here. And sometimes people will pull that up and keep the root but if you've got a disease or a problem on your mother or seed stock, you're going to re actually spread it out further. And you don't want to do that. So it's just a matter of how you harvest your potato slips. It's very important to try to get equal and, and high quality ones because if you don't, when you start transplanting them, then when you go to dig them up in the fall, you're going to have variability from hill to hill. And that was one of my personal problems and still is. Um, so these are some, it's mostly a visual inspection. You want to look and make sure it's true to your variety characteristics, meaning shape, color, um, and other things that you can visually inspect for. Uh, if you ship them, you want to loosely pack them, ship them in an upright position. I saw somewhere in some research that laying them down and, and being careless could affect long-term Production and if you buy some certified plants or, or want to plant them in your field, don't mix your certified with other things that are not certified. Um, I saw some research that suggests, and I'm going to say suggest, but I think it's something worth looking into. If you hold your slits for one to three days, you could actually increase your production, but if you held them more than three days in the shade, you can start losing production. And that was just one of the things that I might would like to look at with some of the farmers that we might try to do little demonstrations or something with, is let's look at some of that sort of thing and see what kind of effects we can have. Because again, it could be variety specific, it could be weather specific, it could be a lot of things. Um, you tend to have more number ones, and I see a word I misspelled, finally. I looked at it a couple times, but anyway, that you have more marketable potatoes and more storage roots, which is what we are trying to grow is storage roots. Um, I thought it was very interesting. I'm going to watch the time, but how did they come up with new varieties? And once I got to digging into this stuff, I could talk 30 minutes about that alone. I figured I could say it in two words, but you can't. I often wonder why don't we have varieties coming out every couple of years like we have cotton and soybeans and these other things. Well, one of the problems with sweet potatoes, they have three sets of chromosomes, if I'm saying it right, and that means there's a lot of genetic variability. So what they do, they, they make, like on the left, a, a garden or a yard where they want to cross the potatoes and they encourage them to bloom. And I could talk a few minutes just about all of that, but I won't. They go back and collect the seeds and keep up with where they keep them or pick them up and they start roguing them out in a greenhouse. And this greenhouse is basically, they've kept up where the plants came from and it'll go through this process for up for maybe 10 years before they release a new variety. So that's why if something like gava root knot comes out, 
They can't instantly come up with something new that's marketable. Now, if you just want new potatoes, a new variety, that's easy, but it, you might have something you can't sell as useless. Um, this is just an example of something we did a few years ago at one of our schools. We had the different, some, some orange ones, some, uh, I think those are burgundies in the middle, and probably some type of white ones. I don't remember the exact varieties, but I wanted to introduce the kids to different varieties and let them see that there's more than what we normally think of being orange. This is an example of a purple one. North Carolina does have a new purple one that's out. This would be a good one to maybe consider if your market so desires purple sweet potatoes. There's also white ones and there's also orange ones. Um, in Africa, they grow a lot of white potatoes and I reckon Dr. Dossi could tell me more about it than me because that is his home territory, but if you were selling to ethnic markets, it would be very useful to understand what that ethnic the market desires so you could grow it. So that's one reason I wanted you to be able to taste some different colors and types of sweet potatoes. Um, this is how sweet potatoes reproduce in the wild, I would think. They do bloom. Some varieties don't. Hernandez has been a good variety for some of us but you very rarely see a flower on it. And then when you pick the seeds out, they look just like morning glory seeds. They're very small and you could replant them, but you don't really know what you're gonna come back with because they're gonna be crossed. Um, this is how you can lay them out in the seed bed if you want to grow them. Now I know this is a commercial production thing, but just picture in your mind how you could do it in a smaller area. If you want to encourage Early slip production, you need to cover it with plastic, but you also need to put some holes in it and let some air come through it because that's, potatoes do need a lot of air when they, you're trying to grow out the slips. And once they get big, if they get too hot under there, they'll start dying like they did in, in slide D. Uh, I just wanted to run, I won't even talk about it, I just wanted you to be able to see these things a little bit better. I hate that it's not clear, but some of this I did pick off of YouTube when you at Louisiana State had their virtual field day, and if you want to take a deeper dive in some of these subjects, that's an easy way to do it. But I just want you to see how it can be done. Um, and I also want you to see how the difference in, in having covered versus uncovered beds. This is a shot of the same dead beds on April 17th and by the 24th of April, you can see the difference. Now, of course, a real live field day, you could actually walk down there and see a better difference, but that's the best I could do. Um, this is getting back to how if you hold them for a few days, some of the benefits could include easy establishment, more marketable roots, improved plant stands, and improved root establishment. That is what you want. Roots that are seven days come on to the potato after seven days comprise about 86% 86 of your final storage route. And, and this was again under Beauregard under certain conditions. We always throw that out because you could have certain conditions. But the message that I want you to take a home from this is the fact that you want that, product, that slip to grow as fast and as healthy as you can because you want roots to start forming. You don't want a plant, in my mind, to survive, you want it to thrive. And that's sort of been my motto when I'm trying to grow something new. Um, I had trouble with pencil roots. I think a lot of it was due to poor irrigation or no irrigation in my case. And pencil roots, if you've never seen them, they'll just keep growing. And I reckon looking for moisture is what the logical explanation would be. Um, this is just a quick example of on the left and the right what drip irrigation or some type of irrigation can do for you. If it's not even, like if it's raining and dries, some varieties will split. Some are more prone to split than others. So it, this is part of what makes sweet potatoes so interesting. You can't always say that this variety will do what that variety, it may not. But this is just to let you know where the roots come from. You want to try to plant five to six nodes down under the ground. And if you look, when you're looking at good plants, you'll see those little bumps or where they act like they are. That's where your roots come from. And ideally, 
And within 24 hours, you should have roots starting. And that's ideal conditions. Um, there are two ways to consider about planting. And our traditional way is vertical. And I'm going to try to go through this because this, to me, was one of the interesting things that maybe Philip and I can look at, at least, you know, with some of it is interested. There's some pros and cons to it. Vertical, you have a lot, you may have, your roots will go down and your transplant may not dry out as quick because when you lay them vertical, you're talking about laying a, a longer slip in about two inches of soil. But the, I'll show you in a second what the su research suggests that you can do. But if you let that two inches of soil dry out or have other issues, you'll end up hurting your production. So I'm not saying you need to do this on 100 acres or all your garden. Pick you out four or five hills and try it this year and, and just let's just see. And it could be some varieties respond to this management technique better than others. Um, but this is what sort of sold me on it. And I have done it not knowing what I was doing. I had some long slips. I said, I don't want to cut them up. I'm just going to bury them. And I noticed it, but I really paid it no attention. But you can sort of see that we're getting some roots and they're more evenly spaced along the plant stem. And this is a few more days later, you'll be seeing these, these darker roots can turn into being sweet potatoes. And that's what you want. This is a few more days later. You can see now on the left-hand side, the vertical planting, you have less number one storage roots. I suspect if you want to hit a specialty market with more jumbos and large, you may want to do vertical because you have less on the plant. I don't know that. That's just my gut feeling. And again, that's something maybe we can look at on our demonstration farm or something. Um, this is a few more days later for Bayou Bell. I hope uh, you did you bring any information on Bayou Bell? Yeah, it's one of my varieties. Okay, we're going to just, just skip through it. But I think the way I think it would fit into the fresh market, it's a 90 day potato if I remember right. Well, I hope 90 because we want to, we want to be first to the market. Um, this is a horizontal planted potato, and you can see how it's progressing, how the potatoes have a good shape and more room to shape up. And I hate to say it, but we do when we go buy potatoes at a market or something, we want pretty shaped potatoes, and most people do. Um, this is, again, 90 days. These are probably ready to harvest if that's your market size. They were horizontal. I wanted to mention about irrigation. Drip irrigation is a very good way to go with it. If you mechanically harvest them, you just got to be aware that you got to drip tape and do some things to handle it. Overhead will work also, but you also encouraging weeds and everything else to grow. So, but it, some irrigation is, could be very important. This is again showing root initiation on a slip. Um, denser ladder roots equal more storage roots. So that's why I'm encouraging the farmers and people that are interested to try to encourage that root and that plant to grow just as fast as it can because that's what you want. You want to try to make use of the long days and the growing time because that's what it takes to size up potatoes. This is a simple potato digger. I wish I owned one. It was over at Blackville before COVID. I don't know if they were just testing it, but I thought it was neat because it was a one row simple thing. It didn't seem to bruise them up, but I suppose I won't say this, but some varieties will skin easier than others. I won't get into that no more other than to say that's just a consideration. Um, this is my contact information. I hope I didn't get too long on my talk, Philip. Um, ask us questions, feel free to. And before I forget it, if you need pesticide license credits, I have the sign-in sheet. I hadn't said anything because we won't those of you that want or need pesticide credits, you need to sort of stay for the whole meeting. So I'm telling you now that we do have an hour and a half, and I'll put this out near the end of Phillip's um, talk. We got an evaluation. Please fill that evaluation out. We're trying to improve our programs. I've been wanting to do a sweet potato production meeting for years, and we finally 
everything lined up because I know we've had, I've had small farmers growing them here in Bowman and I've noticed some disease problems and I told Philip I took some of those same plants and did what the book said, cut them above the, the bed. I planted them in a garden that tested, I think it was 6'4 or 6'2 at a school. They had nothing but grass growing in it for 40 years or more. And I made some of the prettiest potatoes I've ever seen. Almost no blemishes or nothing. But most of us couldn't go 40 years rotation. But I just wanted to see what effect it did. And it did make a difference. So if there's any questions, um, Ask me afterwards. I want Philip to have a lot of time because I think his subject, you will get a lot of questions because we've run into the issues that he's going to bring up. And he's also, I, I think, going to talk about some of his experiences last year a little bit that he could talk about. And we got a lot that we can do with sweet potatoes. I love to see this industry come back in some form or fashion in this area. And for our little farmers, I think it's a good fit because I've had a lot of little farmers talk to me about how they are selling out, and that's good. We want to increase and do a better job, and with the information that they give us, we can protect our knowledge and protect our industry as we grow it. So with that, I appreciate it. Um, if you need more tea or something, restrooms, I didn't say they're down the hall, but I want to respect your time, so we're going to keep right on going. I appreciate everybody's patience, because we're trying to put this up for folks that couldn't be here on YouTube and to help me with my, our job positions because all of us are trying to do new things and this is new for some of, for some of us agents. All right, let me sit down if I talk the whole night, but thank you. I'm gonna be talking about sweet potato varieties, insect and disease management. Um, and I'm just gonna jump right into this. So, one of the big things to do is you got to scout your crop, okay? Sweet potatoes are like anything else. They're like corn, cotton, soybeans, peanuts. You got to be out in your fields. You got to scout. Um, and you need to start early. Just as soon as your slips are in the ground, within seven to 10 days, you need to be out looking for disease, uh, looking for insect pests. Uh, one of the bigger uh, disease issues right after uh, slip transplant is uh, pythium or damping off. It'll, it's a fungal infection. Your, your slips will look great one second and then just die the next. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation. But you look for the obvious, you look for your adults, your larvae, your eggs, and different host species like Thad had mentioned. Uh, Morning Glory is a host species for a lot of insects. Um, and diseases in sweet potato because they're in the same family. And you have to look for the not so obvious in sweet potato because a lot of the insects are soil borne insects. So sometimes you have to dig right next to your sweet potato plants in order to see uh, that, those larval stages or the adult insects as well. So getting into some common pests. The biggest one that I have seen thus far in my career with extension is wireworm complex and it's a, a beetle larva, specifically a click beetle larva um, and it causes damage to the tubers themselves and uh, Mark's pass, well he was going to pass a potato around. Uh, some people saw some of the, you got the potato mark with the wireworm damage? Yeah, Doing other things, I can pass this around. Yeah, be, be my Vanna White. Oh, okay. Oh, I got you now. So, so, Mark's holding a potato that has a, a one small area of wireworm damage. And these little uh, insect larvae are only about a quarter of an inch long, and they're very hard to detect. Um, and the easiest way to prevent them is to use a pre-plant uh, insecticide. We used to could use Lors Ban, but it has since been taken off the market and is no longer labeled for use in uh, fruit and vegetable crops. Um, so in its place, uh, it's recommended that you use Admire Pro um, as a soil incorporated insecticide, as well as uh, Bifenthrin or a pyrethroid. Uh, to give you a zone of protection around those roots so that you don't get that infestation. 
The bottom picture is, uh, is a potato that's actually infested with wireworm. They bore into the tuber itself and can create rot and leave that potato non-marketable. And up top is uh, six species of click beetle and what the larva look like and that is what's going to cause that damage. Alright, so then we get into our sweet potato flea beetle. Uh, this one's more of a foliar pest. Um, if y'all like to bird hunt, it's like somebody took a shotgun and just shot uh, bird shot through your leaves. It just perforates them like nobody's business and it doesn't take them very long to get out of hand. Um, all these uh, bugs in the photo here on the right corner, those are all separate uh, uh, sweet potato flea beetles, or, or flea beetles, excuse me. The sweet potato flea beetle is the one at about uh, five o'clock right there, letter E. And he's a tiny, tiny, tiny little bug. He's about the size of a pinhead. Um, but you know when you've got them because of that damage. Um, now, they're a bigger pest of foliage and, and uh, vines themselves, not so much the tuber. Um, but it can, if at a high enough quantity, they can cause defoliation of the vines, which can decrease your crop yield. And uh, with a decreased crop yield, you make less money for your crop at market. Um, now, you're going to see a common theme, though. All these insects so far are soil born in their larval stage. The larva is what you have to watch for the most. It's not so much the adult. So just like wireworm, you treat this the same way with either Lors, uh, well, it used to be Lors band, but now it's an Admire Pro or a Pyrethroid. Um, and one of my favorite phrases for this one, as well as wireworm, is cleanliness is next to godliness. So you need to keep your fields clean of weeds during the winter time because both pests overwinter in morning glory, dog fennel, uh, and they also overwinter in the neighboring woods. So if you can rotate out of sweet potatoes for three years, it's even better. How many of y'all have heard of cucumber beetle? What were you growing, sir? The idea of cucumber. Okay, were you growing anything else other than cucumber? Squash, everything. Yep, they, they are a they are a pest of almost everything that you could grow in a garden. Um, and there's three different species of cucumber beetle. Um, so the, there's the spotted, which is the first striped and banded or banded and striped. Um, but they all, they look different and that's the only major difference. They all predate the same species, they all pupate and uh, have the same life cycle and they all prefer the same crops. So, and again, they're controlled the same way as you would wireworm or a uh, flea beetle with a pyrethroid or uh, Admire Pro. Um, let's see where, Now, one thing I didn't mention on that first slide with the wireworm is I got called out to a grower in Clarendon County. Um, and Mark mentioned this and it, it just reminded me to go over it. I had a grower that had 800 acres of sweet potatoes that was growing for the cannery and all 800 acres got rejected because of wireworm damage. So if you do not control these pests early and often with the proper insecticide at planting, it can cost you dearly in the long run. Now, for me, I haven't missed many meals as y'all can see. It wouldn't have bothered me to went out into that field and picked a potato for myself to eat, but the general public in the cannery are looking for that exquisite potato with no blemishes, that's perfect, that's not too large, those number ones, not the jumbos. So now we're going to get into our diseases. One of the ones that I've seen 
up around the lake more often is powdery mildew. It's a fungus. It uh, decreases your plant's activity to uh, intercept sunlight. And it, you see it more in cooler, cooler nights that, with a heavy dew. Um, now you can treat for it. Planting at the right time is your best bet. But some of the active ingredients that work on it are switch, Marivis Prime, and Quadris Top. Um, the only downside to that is they're expensive. Um, you can get away with some uh, um, organic um, fungicides, some sulfurs, some uh, phosphates, or phosphites, excuse me. Um, and, but it's one that you may or may not see depending on how wet or how cool we are early in the planting season. White mold or sclerotinia, I've seen this one in um, sweet potatoes, strawberries, corn, cut flour. If it's a crop that's economically important in South Carolina, I've seen it. Um, and it also likes cool, moist uh, conditions which is early in our growing season. And it's easily identifiable by the white mycelia or the little fuzzy part growing in the right hand picture. And it almost looks um, like cotton candy almost. Now, if you're unsure of if it's uh, sclerotinia, you can cut the stem open and you might not be able to see it very well here, but in that bottom picture, there are these little black um, oblong uh, fruiting bodies called sclerotia and that's a dead giveaway that that is sclerotinia. Um, now let's see and again your treatment options for it are kind of limited. Um, the phos phosphites, uh, Miravis top, uh, Omega 500, F would be ones that would control it. They're a little bit more systemic and offer a prolonged uh, control, but you don't want to use too many of the same active ingredients over or else you uh, run the risk of building a resistance. Now, if you grow any other vegetables from seed, damping off may be a problem. Um, we see this in squash, peppers, turnips, okra, tomatoes, um, a lot in corn. Uh, pythium, it, it's a fungal infection that clogs the vascular tissue in that seedling. So you'll notice a little brown spot or a ring around the stem and that's effectively a choking point. So it cuts off everything to those leaves and top portion and it's dead before it even knows it. The roots don't even know the top's not there anymore. Um, it's also known as wire stem because it'll twist and flop over and it looks like a piece of old bent barbed wire. Um, and uh, it's <laughs> moist soils at planting is the key to that one. If you are too moist and too humid, you can have damping off. And I've also included Randman, Ritamil, and Presidio. Those are probably the best options as far as a chemical control for uh, damping off. And again, you see it throughout the planting season, whether it's sweet potato, corn, peas, beans, tomatoes, um, it's pretty prevalent. So that's the th three or four diseases that I chose to cover as far as the disease portion goes. And now I'm gonna dip into a little bit of the uh, Varieties of merit. Uh, yes, ma'am. What about some little on the squash? Some little white, just little white ones. Um, that it, are they on the leaves or the fruit? Oh. Um, do they look fuzzy or are they glossy? Fuzzy, like That's probably mealybug. Right. Um, and they can be a little bit difficult sometimes. They usually have a. Uh, a uh, boom in population after a dry spell, um, but they are easily controlled with either a high pressure hose or alcohol 
Um, you want to stay away from your oils, but an insecticidal soap also works very well for mealybugs. Yes. Oh, different. So the first uh, variety is Covington. Um, if you've eaten a potato recently, a sweet potato out of the grocery store, not from the ones we had tonight, but one from Piggly Wiggly, Bilo, Lo, um, Food Lion, any of those stores, you've more than likely consumed the Covington. It's the most widely planted sweet potato in the southeast right now. And it's the most widely planted because it has a tougher, thicker skin on that potato. So uh, Mark showed the uh, mechanical digger that uh, they had down at Edisto Rec. During the digging process, that thing tends to beat up and bruise a potato. Not so much the Covington. Um, it seems to be a little bit tougher and a little more dense. Uh, and it's, that's why it's so widely planted. That and it is highly uh, root knot resistant, root knot nematode resistant. And of the potatoes that we're going to cover, it's probably got one of the better disease packages um, in regards to a lot of the uh, fungal pathogens and root knot nematode. Um, it's a brilliant orange and an orange flesh. Um, the taste is pretty fair, but it's, it's not as sweet as I would like in a sweet potato. Um, it's a good, it's a great potato, but it's just not quite sweet enough for my taste. Oops. So Mark also mentioned this one. This one's Bayou Bell. Um, it is an orange, or, a, or I'm sorry, it's a red burgundy skin with a deep, deep orange flesh. Um, if y'all if have ever grown Evangeline, it's a lot like Evangeline. Um, but it has a firmer texture when it's baked, which I like a good firm potato when it's baked. I don't want, want it to turn to mush. Um, and it's highly soft rot was it resistant. So after you've harvested, if you're storing your potatoes, you don't have to worry about uh, Bayou Bell rotting quite as quickly or as fast. Um, and it has shown uh, to be 10% more uh, or heavier yielder or higher yielder than Beauregard, which is another very common variety, um, which is also on the list. But Bayou Bell, um, I was at a trial planting of it in Aiken County. Um, and from what I could gather, it does very well from slips if you want to start your own slips. Um, and the taste is better. It's got a more sweet, sugary taste. Um, so if you like good sweet potato pie, it's a, it's a little bit better than Covington. Um, and it's also a Louisiana variety. Um, Covington came out of North Carolina in I think 87. No. But it came, it came from Dr. Covington's uh, breeding program at North Carolina State. Bayou Bell came out of Louisiana. Then we get into Burgundy. Mark also mentioned this one. Um, it's a deeper orange potato all around on the flesh and on the skin itself. Um, got a pretty high sugar content in comparison to the Covington or uh, Hernandez, uh, some of the other ones. And it has a fair disease resistance. And what I mean by that is it does have some disease resistance to almost all the common disease issues and root knot nematodes, but it's not highly resistant. So it's kind of in that, it's okay, but it's not great uh, resistance uh, category, except for the root knot nematode. That's one where it excelled. Um, and in our area, um, I have seen high variability in root knot nematodes where one field uh, will have a little corner that'll just be off the charts with nematode. Five feet from there, you'll have almost no nematode. So you always want to have a nematode resistance in our sandy soils. Um, and Mark also touched on irrigation quality as well, which I didn't go into, but I'll address now. You want good, consistent irrigation um, and deep irrigation because that encourages those roots to grow and expand so that you have more of the number ones, jumbos, more of the more marketable potatoes. Beauregard, this is the one that if you stopped at any garden center here lately, this one's the one that they carry. 
It's a great potato. Uh, I'm actually growing some right now in a bed in Calhoun County. Um, light red to pink skin, good orange flesh. The only downside that I've really seen that is uh, susceptible to bacterial root rot. Um, actually very susceptible. So if you've got a wet year or a wet condition, there's a good chance that you're gonna lose a lot of those potatoes due to that wet condition and that spread or proliferation of that bacteria. Um, but with that being said, it does have uh, fewer issues with grub worms. So if you have Japanese beetles or uh, uh, what's, the, what's that other beetle, uh, June bug, uh, you have fewer issues with that in your fields. Um, but it stores very well, so you can store this one for an extended period of time in a cool, dry place. My granddaddy used to store them in old sawdust in an old barrel tucked back in the barn. Um, not Beauregard in particular, but just his seed potatoes. Um, and it, from research, research has shown that it does store a little bit better than some varieties. Now this one brings us, I think, to the end of the presentation. And I kind of threw this one as an homage to my daddy. His name's Henry, and I saw it in our crop handbook and just couldn't say no. But oh, Henry, it's one of the white fleshed ones, um, or white meated ones. The one thing that I have seen or noticed or read about is that it tends to be a drier potato. So when you bake it or, or, or cook it, the flesh isn't n nice and moist. It, it tends to be a little bit more harsh. Um, and it's cream tan, but the, the uh, upside quality of that is it's stringless. You know how you get one of those big jumbos, you pull the skin off and at the ends you pull the string and it's like unraveling one out of a coat. It just keeps going and going and going. With O. Henry, it's not been seen to be stringy, um, but it's, an, it's definitely an unusual potato. Um, one that I have yet to really see in commerce without having the special order.